Hi right, guys, in this video we are going to introduce the topic of valence bond theory. Effectively, what we're going to be doing is extending the, uh, this concept of bonding and molecules that we uh, introduced with the idea of the Lewis dot model and incorporating qu the quantum mechanical result or the quantum mechanical truth that electrons actually reside in orbitals. All right, so we're basically tacking orbital concept onto the Lewis dot model. So as you guys remember that this Lewis model provided a very simplified representation of valence electrons um, in the model, in a molecule, right? We showed these electrons, these little dots, we showed the uh, paired electrons, electrons that are shared between two atoms as lines, so bonding electrons are lines, and we could actually get an awful lot done with this. We could use things like the octet rule and formal charges and actually determine this quote unquote best electron configuration for many different molecules. We were, and we were very successful in this regard. We could, I, we could predict um, with a very good degree of accuracy, surprising degree of accuracy, what compounds would and would not form. Okay? Now, of course, the limitations of this model um, you know, start to come into play when you start asking you know, more complicated questions like, okay, well, electrons can move around. Well, then we had to introduce the idea of resonance. Then we had to talk about resonance hybrids. And, and we started to have to kind of almost, it might have felt a little artificial um, in terms of being, having to tack on additional concepts to the Lewis model. And of course, that all boils down to the fact that the Lewis model ignores the very fundamental truth that electrons reside in orbitals. So just as we saw before, when we are, are describing electron structure around an atom, these atoms are on all these little tiny orbitals, s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, f orbitals, and the list goes on and on, right? So they have all these interesting shapes, right? And the key aspect of orbitals is that it, that electron is, in a very real sense, spread out, distributed throughout space, okay? And, and so by localizing these electrons to either dots or lines, right, we're ignoring that fundamental wave-like character of the electron, okay? And so this is where valence bond, the valence bond model comes in, right? We're basically improving upon the Lewis model. And so the valence bond model provides a more complete understanding of the electron distributions in molecules by using orbitals. Okay? And very specifically, the valence bond theory describes a covalent bond, um, a sharing of electrons, as essentially an overlap of orbitals, or more specifically, an overlap of half-filled orbitals. So in the example of hydrogen here, we've got one hydrogen atom with a single 1s electron, another hydrogen atom with a single 1s electron. Well, what you can do is bring both of those orbitals together, smash them together, get one big orbital, all right, illustrated here, with two electrons hanging out um, in this orbital. And what you're effectively doing is describing a new probability density where that probability density is distributed over both of these nuclei. Okay. And once again, right, the, the fact that this probability density is uh, spread about over both of these nuclei, we're still getting that attractive force, that binding force, so those electrons are really serving as that glue, that electrostatic glue holding the two nuclei together. Okay? And, and so that's our covalent bond, right? an overlap of these two orbitals. Okay. And so it's actually, uh, you know, now that we have this orbital concept, we can now start to take a closer look at the energetics of bonding itself, right? Now, so what I'm illustrating here um, is the energy, this black curve is the energy of these two hydrogen atoms. And more specifically, what I'm looking at here is really the interaction energy. Okay, the interaction energy between these two hydrogens. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm not, I don't necessarily care about just the, the absolute energy of any of these hydrogens. What we're interested in is the interaction between the two atoms. So when these two atoms are very separate from one another in space, there's a large degree of separation between the two atoms, then from an electrostatic standpoint, um, you know, the strength of that interaction becomes very, very small. And as in, in the limit, as this distance between the two atoms, which we're gonna call R, increases, right, that interaction energy will actually go to zero. And so what I've illustrated here by the dashed line is this zero point for the interaction energy. The atoms are so far apart that they're not seeing each other. 
Okay. Okay, so now let's assume that we've got these two hydrogen atoms are very separate, very far apart from one another. The interaction energy is little, very small. As you start moving those hydrogen atoms closer and closer together, an interesting thing starts to happen. The energy, the interaction energy starts to decrease. This is stabilizing, okay? And this decrease in energy, right, lowering of the energy, just like a ball rolling down the hill to a lower gravitational potential energy, right, these two hydrogen atoms are moving down this well, this potential well into an area of greater stability, right? This can be understood in terms of this orbital overlap concept. When you're very far away, you have very little orbital overlap. When you're down here, you will get um, a, a point actually where you will get maximum ov orbital overlap. And in fact, the low point on this curve, right, we typically denote this as REQ, which is also known as the equilibrium bond length. Okay, so we'll talk about this later on in the class. Atoms are always moving around, they're always vibrating, right? But there is a distance, right, where the potential energy between the two nuclei is minimized, right? And that's right here at the very bottom of this potential well. Now, if you start moving those atoms closer and closer together, yes, you will be getting increasing overlap of the orbitals. However, the two nuclei will start to repel one another. You get an internuclear repulsion regime, and that's why the corresponding potential energy starts to skyrocket. You start doing nuclear reactions over here on, on this end. Okay, so this orbital overlap concept is really powerful. And so we're gonna take some time now to talk about, you know, in a little bit more detail, the types of overlapping interactions and the symmetries, geometries really, of these orbital overlap uh, interactions. So the, the first thing I wanna introduce is this concept known as a sigma bond, okay? So we know that orbitals overlap, that gives rise to a bond, great, okay? But the way these orbitals overlap um, changes depending on the type of bond that we're forming, okay? And so the first type of bond is the sigma bond. And really what a sigma bond is, is a bonding interaction, an orbital overlap interaction, where the electron density is concentrated in the region along the internuclear axis. So you could have an S orbital and an S orbital coming together. You're increasing overlap here in the, along the axis connecting the two nuclei. You could have an S orbital and a P orbital. Again, you're increasing orbital overlap on the axis. Two P orbitals coming together, same sort of story, okay? And the, all of these different options, right, we're increasing electron density between the two nuclei, right? We're getting the sigma bond. Now, it's, it's a good thing to ask, like, okay, well, why is it that that happens? And, and this question right down here is posed, and I think best answered by a simple example. Why do we get this sort of head-on direct overlap rather than a side-by-side? -side? Well, the answer is, you know, orbitals with these half-fill orbitals it's energetically favorable for them to overlap, and you can actually maximize that orbital overlap when you have this sort of end-to-end -end arrangement rather than an angle. So we're not gonna see this angle not as effective uh, electron or orbital overlap. Okay, now, there are, of course, other ways that orbitals can overlap, and really one other way that we care about. So that's the sigma bond, electron density is increased along that nuclear axis. The second type of bond that we're gonna see is the so-called pi bond, okay? And the pi bond is, again, a covalent bond where you have orbital overlap, but this is something that happens when you have a side-by-side -side overlap of two p orbitals. So we're increasing electron density and electron density here. Remember what's happening right here in between these two lobes. This is a node, this is a region of zero electron density, okay? And so the p orbital, or, or the pi orbital, I'm sorry, um, results in an increase in electron density that is on either side of that internuclear axis. So you have up top and on bottom um, an increase in that electron density. Okay. And so this is really the, the pretty fascinating part, in my opinion, of the valence bond model. We can now use this orbital overlap concept and these two different classifications of orbital overlap, sigma and pi, to really come up with a, a pretty satisfying quantum mechanical description of bonding in molecules. 
right? So if we want to see it, look at a molecule that has multiple bonds, right? What we're going to find is that all of those single bonds are going to be formed through this end-to-end -end overlap, right? Sigma bonds, right? Well, single bonds are sigma bonds, okay? Single is sigma. All right. Now, multiple bonds are going to then be comprised of the sigma bond plus additional pi bonds, right? So the first bond form will be sigma. All remaining bonds will be pi bonds. So if I, in this example here, we've got just HCl. There's only one bond, so you get one sigma bond and no pi bonds. If you have O2, two bonds, one sigma, one pi. N2, one sigma and two pi bonds. All right. And so to understand this, and, and this is where I, I think, you know, again, valence bond model gives us this very nice, succinct quantum mechanical picture of what's happening in terms of the electron density. Right. We can think about the orbitals that are present on the carbon atoms in this C2H2 um, molecule uh, illustrated at the bottom of the screen here. Right. The carbon atom has three P orbitals. Right. Three of these P orbitals. And so these three P orbitals can end up um, being inv involved in multiple different bonds depending on their orientation. The P orbitals that are directly facing one another between the two carbons in purple here will undergo this head-on overlap, increasing the electron density on that internuclear axis, right? Which is the hallmark of a sigma bond. The other two P orbitals will overlap in this side-to-side -side fashion, giving rise to a pi bond that's going up and down and another pi bond going in and out of that screen. Okay, and, and so one of the, the goals of this chapter um, and, and this lesson in particular is to say, okay, well, we, we're, we're putting quantum mechanics in, we're understanding the electronic structure of molecules, keeping in mind this idea of orbitals, and what we ultimately want to be able to do is understand geometry of molecules. And so one of the successes of the valence bond model is, you know, for example, describing um, using an orbital based description, the geometry of H2S. So H2S, if we're following the, the valence bond model, has these two hydrogens and a sulfur. And we've got a total of four half filled orbitals the 1s on each one of the hydrogens, and then two half-filled 3p orbitals on that sulfur. When those orbitals come together and overlap, right, we end up forming two separate bonds. The electron density is um, increased along both of those two bonds. Now, when you do that, you're, you're of course, forming two sigma bonds, right? We've got a sigma bond here and a sigma bond here. We know from the arrangement of p orbitals, each one of these p orbitals is 90 degrees, um, the axis of those p orbitals is 90 degrees from one another. And so we would predict, uh, according to this model, a 90 degree angle between um, the, uh, H, the two HS bonds. Right? And it turns out that this is in very good agreement with experimental evidence, which tells us that uh, the experimental bond angle is 92 degrees. Right? So these standard atomic orbitals work very well in the valence bond model of H2S. However, we quickly start to run into a few problems here. If we want to say, for example, consider the valence electron configuration for carbon and hydrogen, um, in uh, what we would end up with is a picture like this. We've got our valence electrons for carbon, valence electrons for hydrogen. We've got two half-filled carbon orbitals, two um, hydrogen uh, 1s orbitals can then come in to form two sigma bonds, and we would then predict the molecule CH2 to form. Okay, well, that should automatically start raising some flags, right? It kind of flies in the face of what, what we were learning about before with the basic Lewis model, okay? So not only do, do we run into some issues with, uh, you know, the, the number, the ratio of atom types that forms in the, in the simplest carbon-hydrogen uh, molecule, but also, we, it would also predict a 90-degree bond angle. And so in reality, not only do we have... Um, you know, a CH4 molecule that, that actually forms, but the bond angle is 109.5. So this is a problem. How on earth are we going to 
un, uh, describe the geometry of these molecules that, that we've talked about before, tetrahedral, trigonal planar, right, trigonal bipyramidal, right? A lot of these different structures have bond angles that don't necessarily coincide with the direction of our canonical atomic orbitals. Okay, and so that's going to bring us to our next video in the sequence here. The answer to that question is, well, we're going to have to actually mix together different combinations of atomic orbitals to generate orbitals, which we're going to call hybrid orbitals, which accurately predict molecular geometries. And so this process is known as hybridization, and stay tuned for the next video. We'll go into a lot of detail on hybridization and how to use it, what it is, how to use it, um, how to solve problems.